Hello and welcome to the best games from every year I've been alive. It's my 42nd birthday and I thought it would be a fun task to look back at every year I've been alive and pick out a game from each year that I thought was a standout for me. Now for some years this was a heck of a lot harder than others. There's a few years where there's like only one or two games that I've played. Now I've played like in excess of 500, maybe a thousand games. But there's like a hundred thousand games made. So there's a good chance for each year, there's a heck of a lot of good games I haven't played. So this list is very much what I've played and what I found fun from each year. Another rule is that in general I'll pick a year the game was first published. But in some cases where I had limited choices, I might pick an earlier edition of a game that I ended up playing a later edition of that I really liked. And as always, this is just my opinion. This isn't a definitive list. Although I will talk about each year's top games on Board Game Geek as well. Alright, so let's kick this off with 2019. Now I kind of have to cheat here, I haven't played any games published in 2019. It's only February, I live in New Zealand, I'm not going to get new releases until probably March. So in order to fudge this, I'm going to pick a game I really like that was published earlier but is getting a new edition this year, and that is Suburbia Collector's Edition. Suburbia is my favourite city builder, it's my favourite game from Biza Games, and the new Collector's Edition looks so over the top wonderfully well produced that I'm selling on my original edition of Suburbia and its expansions. But as I haven't played the new edition, I'm not going to get too much into that. It's on Kickstarter if you want to check it out. 2018. 2018 was a pretty good year for board games, and a really good year for New Zealand board games with Endeavour and Architects of the West Kingdom doing well. Some of the standout games from this year were Root, Everdell, Brass, and Nemesis. But my favourite game published in 2018 was Lords of Hellas, uh, which took the dudes on a map concept to the next level for me, multiple paths to victory, fantastic looking figures, and it really allowed you to have an emergent playstyle. If you like that sort of risk type game, this is one of the best ever made. Definitely go check it out. 2017 might be one of the best years ever for board gaming. We had Gloomhaven, Guy Project, Twilight Imperium 4th Edition, 7th Continent, Azul, Anachrony, This War of Mine, Sidereal Confluence, and a bunch of other really great games come out. It's an outstanding year. And while I imagine a lot of people would have Gloomhaven as their number one, or maybe Guy Project, for me, it's Spirit Island. Spirit Island has a unique theme and a unique concept of being an anti-colonialism game. The different spirits within the game have a wide variety of variable powers, there's heaps of different paths to victory, and very few games I've ever played have had more ability to customize the difficulty within the game. Spirit Island is one of the rare co-ops where it's really hard for someone to sit there and tell everyone else what to do. Because there's just so many moving parts and so much to do. It's not a game for everyone because it is quite complex and it can be a bit overwhelming. But if you do crack it and you get into it, there are very few games more rewarding to play cooperatively than Spirit Island. 2016 was another great year for games. With Scythe, Great Western Trails, Rebellion, Arkham Horror the Card Game, Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition, and Santorini all coming out that year. But for me, the winner is Terraforming Mars. What more can be said about Terraforming Mars? It's number four on Board Game Geek. It sold an awful lot of copies, and there are a bunch of expansions still coming out. But I personally love it because it's a great engine builder that allows you to play with the engine you've built. So for the first half of the game, you're trying to build up a terraforming engine, but for the second half, you're actually using that terraforming engine and doing something with it. And I think that's the secret to its popularity. There are no less than 16 games from 2015 in the Board Game Geek Top 100, including Pandemic Legacy, Through the Ages, Seven Wonders Duel, Viticulture, and Blood Rage. But for me, I'm going to have to go way down the list here, to number 417 at the moment with Argent the Consortium. The reason I really like Argent the Consortium is that most worker placement games are what you call passive aggressive. You put a worker in a place and someone else can't use that. That's about the extent of your interaction. Argent the Consortium is just plain aggressive. Someone's in a place you don't want, you fireball them, you attack them, you do whatever, and I really like that twist on the worker placement mechanic. Also did the anime Magic College theme. Anime is not something I'm really into, but I think it's executed really well here. It's iconic and striking. Definitely a game to pick up if you like the idea of worker placement, but are being put off because they're multiplayer solitaire sometime. Argent the Consortium is not multiplayer solitaire at all. It's actually really mean. There are 12 games from 2014 in the Board Game Geek Top 100, including Orleans, Imperial Assault, Fields of Arl, and Five Tribes. And I nearly picked Roll for the Galaxy for this, but I'm going to go with Xia Legends of a Drift System, a game that just keeps growing on me the more and more I play it. Xia is the ultimate sandbox game. Yeah, it's got some roll and move in it, and that puts some people off. And there's a lot of randomness built into the game. But it's not a game you take seriously when you're playing it. You just get your little ship, decide, I'm going to be a pirate today. And you go off and you do piratey things. Or you decide, I'm going to do trading or I'm going to be a courier. You just pick a direction, 
fly that way and come what may you'll have a lot of fun if you don't take the game too super seriously it's also gorgeous and comes with all the dinky little ships i absolutely adore this game the more i play it the more i love it only four games from 2013 are in the top 100 concordia caverna eldritch horror and russian railroads and of those i've really enjoyed caverna and concordia but for me my favorite game from this year is a distant plane part of the coin series and the first coin game i got to play the reason i picked the distant plane is this game's had a profound influence on me and made me want to make my own coin game. I'd been looking for years for a game system that could replicate counterinsurgency and terrorism, and this game actually nails it pretty damn well. It's also a really good teaching tool to explain what actually happened in Afghanistan, what that conflict was about, and who was actually fighting. As Afghanistan is one of those conflicts there's a lot of misconceptions about, I highly recommend people picking up this game to actually learn about the conflict. But it's also just an intriguing game with the four different factions vying for control over Afghanistan with completely different competing objectives, but having to work together at different times. And it's that blurring of the lines that's so hard to execute in a game, but so much reflects what actually happens in the gray areas of an insurgency. 2012 also sees a whopping 11 games in the top 100 including Terra Mystica, War of the Rings 2nd Edition, and Zulkin. My favourite game from this year is probably Robinson Crusoe Adventures on the Cursed Island. Robinson Crusoe is an odd game. It's a mix of Euro mechanics combined with a lot of really thematic content and randomness. And it's utterly, utterly merciless. But there's some real joy in the game from exploring, scavenging, and building a shelter, and completing the different scenarios, which are all quite different to play through. And it has that little bit of magic that I think was missing from First Martians, which uses the same core system. And I can't quite place my finger on exactly why Robinson Crusoe works so well, but First Martians felt a little flat. If you like narrative heavy games, and the idea of struggling to survive on a desert island sounds good to you, pick up Robinson Crusoe. It's a little heavyweight, and it is a bit hard to learn the rules to start with, but once you crack it, it's a really enjoyable game, especially solo. There are six games from 2011 on the top 100 in Board Game Geek, including The Castles of Burgundy, Mage Knight, and Eclipse. But I'm going to go a bit deeper into the list, and I'm going to pick out Blood Bowl Team Manager, the card game. This is not the last time that something Blood Bowl will appear on this list, as I've been a huge fan of that game for a very long time, but I just really like the Team Manager card game. It takes the theme of Blood Bowl and turns it into a deck builder, and not just a standard deck builder where you start with half resource cards and half attack cards or something, and then slowly spend those cards to buy new things to build up a whopping deck. The deck is your team. And you actually use this team to play against other people in highlights. And that gives a real neat back and forth feel in the game. It's a crying shame this is going to be out of print and probably stay out of print forever. And it's one of those games where rethink probably wouldn't work too well. Just because I can't think of a way to capture the same silliness of Blood Bowl without it being so derivative that it infringes on Games Workshop's IP. I wish everyone could just get along. Be better for games. There are only three games from 2010 in the top 100. Seven Wonders, Dominant Species, and Troys. And I'm going to be really boring and pick the highest rated one, Seven Wonders. There's a reason this game is stunningly popular and has remained popular for a decade. It's really easy to teach. It scales exceptionally well from three to seven players. There's a heck of a lot of player interaction and variety and different ways to build your engine within the game. Sometimes I scratch my head at why a game is highly rated and highly regarded. I don't with Seven Wonders. I can see why this has sold oodles and oodles of copies across the world. It's also one of my favorite games I don't actually own, as we always play a friend's copy when he brings it around. There are only two games from 2009 in the top 100. Dominion Intrigue, and my favorite game from that year, Chaos in the Old World. Chaos in the Old World was the game that put Eric Lang on the designer map. He took on the challenge of taking the Chaos Gods from Warhammer Fantasy and putting them into a game. And that game really worked, like all four of the gods play very distinctly, with Korn relying on being hyper-aggressive to win, whereas Nurgle just wants to pile people into a place and corrupt it as soon as possible. It's another game that's gone out of print, and that's a real shame, although, although you can have a similar play experience with Cthulhu Wars or Eric Lang's later games, Rising Sun and Blood Rage. But if you do get a chance to pick up a copy at a reasonable price, or you get an opportunity to play it at a convention, give it a go. It's a really neat game. 2008 does a lot better. It's got five games in the top 100. Le Havre, Pandemic, Dominion, Stone Age, and my personal favorite game from this year, Battlestar Galactica. Another one of these games that's gone out of print and probably won't come back, and ah, oh, this one upsets me more than any of the others. Battlestar Galactica is such a neat game, and so much fun with my main gaming group. Now this group's a bunch of friends, we've known each other since high school, and we are merciless to each other. 
Cylon accusations begin before we start playing, sometimes the week before we start playing. I don't know that any game executes its theme better than Battlestar Galactica, and it just creates a really neat experience. I've played like 30 odd times, and every time it's been absolute quality. This is a game that is never leaving my collection. There are three games from 2007 in the top 100, Brass, Agricola, and Race for the Galaxy. But I'm going all the way down to the 1500s for GMT's Conquest of Paradise. This game has flown under so many people's radars, and I think it is an exceptional game. I suspect it hasn't done as well as it could have because of the theme and because it looks a bit dry on the outside, but this is an exceptional 4X game. It's set in the Pacific during the Great Polynesian Migration, and it's all about discovering new islands, conquering them, colonizing them, and building up your own culture. It's also respectfully done and represents the people of the Pacific in a true and fair way. And how can I not love a game where you get to discover the island I live on? That's awesome. Don't get to do that in many games. But if you like 4X games, definitely check this one out. It's got a pretty short play time and crams a lot of play into that time. And of the 4X parts, this has the best exploration part of any game I've played. There's only one game from 2006 in the top 100, and that's the original Through the Ages. And this is one year where I kind of struggled to pick a game, but I ended up picking Shogun, a game I played back when it was released, but haven't played since. That's just because I don't own it, and there's been a whole bunch of other games I've picked up in the meantime. What I do remember from the games I played of it was that I was playing with a friend of mine who used to count cards at the casino to make money. And he and I were both counting the cubes in the tower which really annoyed the other two people playing because the two of us were acting like the information of what was in the tower was open information which it wasn't to the other two people playing and that really drove them up the wall my memories of this game are that it was really good and that the cube tower mechanic was something neat that i hadn't played with before it's definitely a game i'd want to try again and i will eventually pick up a copy at some point there are four games from 2005 in the top 100 Kalis, twilight imperium ticket to ride and my personal favorite, Twilight Struggle. I've mentioned this before on the channel, but I did a master's in international relations and I did a bunch of stuff on the Cold War doing that. So Twilight Struggle is a theme that I really connect with. It's a fantastic thematic two-player card-driven game that really takes the Cold War and allows you to replay it. And I really dig this game. It's a little on the heavy side for some people, and it's definitely a game where a skilled player is going to beat the heck out of someone who doesn't know what they're doing. But the thing that makes this game is the agonizing decision process between what you do with the card and how you mitigate the terrible cards you have in your hand so that they don't hurt you. And knowing your opponent is going through the exact same thought process. That's what makes it a compelling game for me and why I keep coming back to it as one of my favorites. There are only two games from 2004 in the top 100. The exceptionally good Power Grid and my personal favorite from this year, War of the Ring. I picked up War of the Ring in about 2005 after playing it multiple times with a friend of mine at a university games club. We continue playing games to this day, and our series of 20 games has currently scored 11-9 in my favor. This is the longest running rivalry I have for one specific game with one specific player, and I've only played it about four or five times with other people. So this is a game about one particular relationship I have with a friend of mine. But overall, the game's just a wonderful thematic experience, and there's a whole bunch of different strategies you can use in this game. You don't have to fight it out like the movies. In my favorite play of this of all time, I took all of the Haradrim and Easterling forces, bypassed Gondor, went through Rohan, past Isengard, straight into the Shire and into the Grey Havens for the win. And I love war games where you're not stuck on rails, fighting the battle as it was historically fought. And yeah, this isn't an actual history, but it kind of is. So the ability to do something completely different and still pull off a win is a fantastic thing in my book. I also spent a heck of a lot of time painting this game as well, and it looks really neat on the table. There are no games from 2003 in the top 100. The highest rated game is Yinch at 149. And for me, the game from this year is a Game of Thrones first edition. I think I'm in a very small group of people whose first exposure to a Game of Thrones was via the board game. I picked this up in about 2004 and played it with a bunch of people, and the whole time they kept going on about the books and how awesome they were, so I actually picked up the books and read them. It's the first and only time I've read a book series based on playing the board game first, which turned out to be a pretty good idea because Game of Thrones has become such a cultural touchstone now. As for the game itself, we used to play this a bunch. It was one of the most popular games for my group at around 2004 through to about 2008, and it works really well when everyone knows what they're doing. This game has gone down a lot in my opinion over the years because it requires everyone to be on a very similar skill level. If you have one player who's not committed to the game or doesn't know what they're doing versus a group of players who do, then that changes the balance in the game. 
The last time I played, someone didn't take the game very seriously and just kept attacking and attacking every turn until all the units were wiped out. That meant the person they were attacking got weakened and the person they weren't attacking to their side just got stronger and stronger and stronger and won with no contest. And there was very little the other players could do to stop that. And that kind of soured me on the game. I think it would still be really good with a group committed to it who all knew how the game worked, but that mix of skill levels just throws the game out of balance something chronic. There's only one game in the top 100 from 2002, and that's my personal choice here, Puerto Rico. Before Puerto Rico came out, I was playing pretty much exclusively what you would call Ameritrash games these days. Stuff with lots of theme, lots of dice, lots of cards. Puerto Rico was the game that made me think, okay, maybe there's something to this Eurogame craze. Before that, I tried other games like Catan, but none of them had really grabbed me. Puerto Rico was the first one that made me go, okay, there's something here. There's actually some really good decisions to be made, and this game's actually quite neat and engaging. Like a Game of Thrones, there's a few problems with it involving player experience, because if you're sitting to the right of someone who doesn't know what they're doing, you can get a huge advantage. But because the playtime is shorter, you can get people up to that skill level a lot quicker. Weirdly, this is a game I haven't played for over a decade. And I don't really know why that is. I think it's because the person I knew who had a copy, I don't see much anymore, and I just haven't bothered picking it up. I still think it's a good game, but I don't think it holds up quite as well today as it did back when I first played it in about 2004. I'd rather play something like Race for the Galaxy, Power Grid, or Concordia, which scratch similar riches. 2001 was apparently not a great year for games, with the highest ranking game being Hive at 209. And I'm going to have to scroll down the list to the thousands to find a game that I think is pretty average, and that's Risk 202010 AD. The reason this game's on this list is I played a lot of Risk when I was younger. It was a frustrating exercise that took too long and it really is the monopoly of dudes on a map games. Risk 202010 shortened the game to five turns, added in a whole bunch of stuff like nukes, commanders and the moon, and just made the game feel a lot better and a lot quicker. And this actually became a game we played an awful lot in the 2000s. I feel it's been completely superseded by Spheres of Influence but it's still probably the best Risk adaption I've played, and easily the game from 2001 I've played the most by far. No top 100 games in the year 2000 either. The highest is Princes of Florence at 131. Now I had to cheat a little with this entry because the highest rated game I played on here was Citadels, and I kind of find that game to be a bit of a dumpster fire these days. So this is the first time I'm really gonna have to cheat and pick a game that I haven't played a huge amount, and that's Battlecry. And the reason I'm picking Battlecry is not because of the game itself, because I've only played one game of this a long time ago, but because of the command and color system. I've played a lot more Battle Law and Memoir 44. So this is more acknowledging Battlecry as the best game of that year because it created a franchise of games that I've ended up playing a lot more. It's a really easy to teach and simple hex-based war game. And the command and color system has gone on to be incredibly successful. So while the American Civil War isn't really my jam, later games I've had a lot of fun with. 1999 also has no games in the top 100. But the highest ranked game is my favorite from this year, and that's Paths of Glory, the World War I card-driven strategy game from GMT Games. This game does a thing I appreciate in war games, and that's allowing you to fight alternatively to how the actual battle fought. It's not on rails. The card-driven nature of the game means events come up at different times than they would during the conflict, and the combat mechanics in this game are absolutely awful. You don't really want to fight, because the costs of attacking at trench positions are just horrifying but as the allies you need to fight on the western front in order for the germans to have to spend their reinforcements on the western front and not on the eastern front because if you don't fight them on the west they just get too strong in the east and knock russia out of the war this is a long game and a complex game it's one that you can easily sit down and spend six hours playing and i've only played a half dozen games of it over the years but every single game has been an intense and challenging experience i wouldn't recommend this game to a lot of people but if you do like the idea of a world war one game and you do have the six hours to commit, and you want to learn the rules and master the game, it's incredibly rewarding. I highly regard this game. The highest rated game from 1998 is Samurai at 182, and I'm going to go a little bit further down the list to For the People from GMT Games at 752. A lot of what I said about Paths of Glory holds true for For the People. It uses virtually the same system to tell the story of the American Civil War. And again, I mentioned with Battlecry, the American Civil War is not my jam, and it's weird having two games featuring the American Civil War on this list, but For the People is a really neat game. I think Paths of Glory is a lot better, and has refined the ideas from For the People to make a better game, but For the People is still one worth checking out, especially if you are interested in the American Civil War. 1997's top rated game is Tigris and Euphrates, and it's the one I'm going to pick as well. This is another game I haven't played for over a decade, and I remember it being pretty good at the time, but it didn't really blow my socks off. I'd probably be more agreeable to it now as I'm more open to more abstract and, and theme-light games than I was back in 2005. 
main reason it's on this list though is 1997 wasn't a great year for games and scrolling down the list I couldn't find anything I really really liked. So I picked Tigris and Euphrates because it's a game I've played that I enjoyed but not one that I have a huge amount of memory of doing so. I can't really say much more about it because my memory of the game is a bit hazy. I probably should play it again sometime. Let's make that a thing I do this year. Play Tigris and Euphrates again. 1996 top ranked game is Hannibal Rome vs Carthage which is a game a lot of people have recommended to me and one that's definitely on my list to pick up. But I'm going to cheat here and I'm going to pick Netrunner. So Netrunner came out in 1996 with a cyberpunk theme and I played it a few times back in the 90s during the collectible card game craze. But I was heavily committed to games like Magic and Jihad at the time so didn't get into it. But I did get into it when it was remade years later as Android Netrunner. And the fascinating thing is, there's not a lot of huge mechanical differences between Android Netrunner and the original Netrunner. It's just a second edition of the same game. The core gameplay is virtually identical. So I think it's worth including at this point as being the best game made in 1996 in my book. This is another great game that might never see the light of day again. Or if it does, it's going to be with a completely different theme again. And this is just the hazards of IP heavy games. I was genuinely sad when I found out that they were cancelling Netrunner. It's just a shame. It is, without a doubt, the best CCG or LCG I've ever played. And I'm hoping it comes back in one form or the other, but that's the problem with CCGs and LCGs. If they go out of print and they come back, it's going to be a different game. You're not going to be able to use the stuff you already have. So I look at my Netrunner collection and I think, that's done. It's closed. It's finished. And that's just kind of sad. 1995 is when Catan came out. And I don't really like Catan. So I'm going to pick Al Grande at number 57 on Board Game Geek, the area control game that 24 years after it was published is still considered the best area control game ever made. And that's not an unfair statement. Al Grande takes those ideas and executes them as well as, if not better than any game that's come since. It's still 57 on Board Game Geek after 24 years, and that's a real achievement. It's pretty simple, it's really engaging, and it has the iconic Black Tower, which is an unforgettable mark of the game. The only area control game I've played that comes close to dethroning El Grande is the unreleased Galilean Moons. 1994's top game is also my favourite, and that's Blood Bowl 3rd Edition. Now, Blood Bowl 3rd Edition, when it came out, looked pretty hammy. It was during Games Workshop, Slicks overproduced things for kids, period. So it actually looks kind of awful by today's standards. But mechanically, it was a vast improvement over 2nd Edition, which was a game I'd played to death. And those mechanical improvements really took the game up a notch. And 25 years on, later editions of Blood Bowl really are remakes of 3rd Edition and not of 1st and 2nd. This is a game I've played a stupid amount over the years. This came out in my last year of high school and all the way through university I played in leagues. And it's got a huge legacy. 25 years on, there's a new edition that only came out last year. Not a lot of good games came out in 1993, but one came out that forever changed board gaming and gaming in general, and that's Magic the Gathering. Love it or hate it, and you can do both. Magic the Gathering has had a profound influence on board gaming and is a game that a lot of people have enjoyed for a long time. It's a juggernaut in the industry. If you don't know anything about magic, then I don't know what rock you've been living under. I don't feel the need to say much about the game, aside from 1993's when magic came out. The game's a big deal. Only two games from 1992 have stayed in the top 1000, and one of them's Loop and Louie for heck's sake. The other one's Modern Art, which is Reiner Knizia's definitive auction game. It's a really simple game, really simple concept, but the auction mechanic just works really well. And it's a game that just keeps coming out in new versions year after year after year. This is one of those classics that's just going to stay around forever. And it's pretty damn good. Like, if you want a pure auction game, you can do a lot worse than picking up Modern Art. 1991's top game is Tichu, a game I can't claim to have played. The next on the list, however, is Formula Day, a game I did quite enjoy back when I played it about 15 years ago. I'm big fan of motorsport i love formula one i'm a big fan of mclaren formula one due to its new zealand heritage and because when i first started watching motorsport it was during the alain prost Ayrton senna era when mclaren were winning everything and those two were squabbling which was great viewing for a young kid formula day is a neat racing game it's been remade multiple times since 1991 a really simple idea of having different dice representing different gears on a car so if you're going faster you roll higher dice but you need to stop in certain areas otherwise you take damage just made for a real simple logical gameplay experience where if you're going too fast into a corner you're probably going to fly off the track again my memory of this game is pretty hazy because i haven't played it in about 15 years but what i do remember was having a lot of fun with it for 1990 the top ranked game is republic of rome and while i have played that it was once many years ago and it was quite an experience and the whole game was quite overwhelming it's what i'd like to play again because my memories of it were that it 
was a neat game, but I just couldn't get my head around it. What I did play an awful lot from 1990 though, is Space Crusade. This was one of the rare cool board games that appeared in toy stores, and a lot of people got it. And I was like 13 when it came out, and it was just the bee's knees. We played so many games after school, and at weekends at people's houses. It built on the success of HeroQuest from a couple of years earlier, but it had Space Marines in it! And 13 year old boys, Space Marines, dice, sliders, yeah, all those things combined to a game that we really enjoyed as kids. I don't know if it would hold up today. I don't really care. I have a lot of fond memories from being a young teenager playing Space Crusade. And sometimes it's best not to revisit games you enjoyed as a kid and just keep the memories as they are. 1989 sees Games Workshop completely dominate the entries with the aforementioned HeroQuest coming out and the game I picked, Space Hulk. So I actually picked up Space Hulk after we'd been playing Space Crusade and it seemed like the next evolutionary step in our gaming. And we played that a heck of a lot from about age 14 through to 17. And I had a lot of fond memories of that game as well, which is why when the third edition deluxe version came out about 10 years ago, I picked that up as well and I took extra effort painting it. And one of the cool things about the third edition is they kept the core gameplay. And the thing with Space Hulk is the rules are actually really simple. It's a stunningly minimalistic design that holds up remarkably well. A lot of games of this era had like flow charts and hit charts and all these tables and references. But Space Hulk boiled down to a couple of D6 rolls with static hit numbers. It was really a resource allocation game where your action points and command points were your resources. And that heightened tension within the game means it's held up remarkably well compared to a lot of its contemporaries. It's still a game I like to play from time to time. The highest rated game of 1988 is Merchant of Venus, another game I have not played. Scrolling down the list is the last Games Workshop game on this list, Blood Bowl 2nd Edition. So you might have gathered from about age 13 I was playing a lot of Games Workshop games. They were the best thing on the market at the time, and Blood Bowl 2nd Edition was one of the first games of theirs I picked up, probably before Space Crusade. We played leagues of this all the way through high school, right up until when 3rd Edition came out. It's another game I've thrashed to death. The only downer on it is that 3rd Edition is so much better that there is absolutely no reason to revisit 2nd Edition whatsoever. Still, definitely a game on this list solely because of nostalgia. 1987 was not a great year for games. I mean, there's Fury of Dracula on there and Bosak. Bosak. It's a funny word. The game I'm going to pick is Illuminati, and Illuminati's not a great game. At the time it was a really fun game, it had some novelty in it, and some cool ideas from the Illuminatus trilogy, but it's not one that has aged well at all. Probably the most profound influence of Illuminati is that because of this game, and because of the Illuminatus trilogy that inspired it, a lot of people think the Illuminati is a real thing. So it's kind of funny to see a lot of the ideas and conspiracy theories played out in this board game from 1987. That the Illuminati is secretly behind things using their mind control lasers in order to control the world. It is however a game I'd like to see redone with modern mechanics. I think the theme is really neat, the ideas behind it are really cool, it's just sluggish and outdated by today's standards. The top games from 1986 are 1830 Railways and Robber Barons, and I've got to admit, I've never played an 18xx game. There's going to be a few people who unsubscribe from me just because I said that. I know there's a big fan base for them, I probably should get around to playing one at some point, but I just never have. There's also a couple of other neat games here, Demarca and Kremlin, which are worth an honourable mention as well. But the game I picked is Fortress America. I really like thematic games, I really like dudes on a map games, and at the time Fortress America was one of the best games in this genre to come out. I also like that it took on a siege idea, that there were three players all competing against one player who was in a race against time. It plays very differently to its contemporaries like Shogun and Axis and Allies. And while I never personally owned the original edition, only playing a friend's copy, I did pick up the reprint when it came out because I was really keen to hold a copy of it and I'm still holding that copy. It's not a game that gets a lot of table play because of the playtime, but it's definitely one of those nostalgia purchases I'm quite happy with. 1985 looked like the year of serious games for serious people, with Advanced Squad Leader and World in Flames being two of the highest rated games. However, I'm going to pick the game which I credit most with getting me into serious wargaming, and that's Battletech. Now, I was 10 when I got a copy of Battletech, and I got it simply because it had a cool mech on the cover, and I was like, wow, I want this game. It's got a cool mech on it. And it was a little overwhelming for a 10 year old who's learning it by himself. I've got to admit, the first few times we played, we got a lot of things wrong. But we kept playing and playing and playing and playing this game. And a lot of people have done that. They've kept playing and playing and playing Battletech ever since. A new edition has literally just come out. That's how enduring Battletech is as a franchise. It's also had countless computer games and other adaptions. And I believe there was a chain of Battletech simulators even in the States for a number of years. By today's standards, it's quite bookkeeping heavy. 
and has a lot of tables and charts. And I think more engaging mech games have come out since. But few games have had such a profound influence on me and created such a legacy in gaming as Battletech. 1984 was a terrible year for games. I'm just looking down the list and not seeing anything I've played or liked. And I keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling until I get down to the 14,000s and find Supremacy. Supremacy is not a good game. It's got problems. It takes forever and just about every game ends in a nuclear explosion. It's a game we played a fair bit at university and we had a lot of fun doing it despite the game. Like it's almost a definition of let's all get together, have beers for six hours, play a game, move some bits around, and eventually it'll all be decided in a nuclear holocaust. Not a good game by anyone's standards today. It wasn't a good game then, and it's not a good game now. But it's literally the only thing I've played from that year. Well, except for Boulder Dash. 1983 actually had some pretty good games come out. Upfront, Ambush, and Scotland Yard are all considered pretty damn classic games even today. Even Talisman, which is one of the first games I ever played, has a lot of fans today. But I'm going to pick something a little bit different, and that's crossbows and catapults at 3070. It's kind of stretching it to say this is a board game, it was kind of more of a toy, but holy heck, when I was young and a friend of mine had a copy of this and all of the expansion stuff for it, we had so much fun with it. You set up your castles, you set up your crossbows, your catapults and all the other stuff and you fling things at each other. It's hard to put into words how much fun this was for someone who was about eight or nine years old. This is absolutely a nostalgia pick but I have no regrets because I had so much fun as a kid playing this game. I believe this has been remade in one form or another, and I am quite keen to pick it up. But I also know that the nostalgia won't be there. It's probably one I'll hold off until we have kids. And then I'll play it with them. A lot. Because that'll be fun. 1982's highest rated game is Survive Escape from Atlantis, but that's not a game I've managed to play. In fact, looking down the list from 1982, there weren't many games on here I had played at all. But the game I'm going to pick is Family Business from 1982. Now Family Business isn't a great game, but it's sort of a precursor to a lot of the party games you see around these days. And I'll be honest, most of the time this was played while drinking at university. So it was mostly a drinking time filler. It's not a game I'd recommend because you can actually be eliminated from the game without taking a turn, and that's kind of a bit nasty by today's standards. But it set the time for later games like Lunch Money and other things that people play at parties to fill time. So, you know, it's not terrible, it's just not great either. But 1982, not a lot of options. 1981's best game is Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, and I should probably win my award, but the power of nostalgia strikes again, and I'm going to pick Axis and Allies, another game I played entirely way too much when I was younger. One of my very first jobs after my paper run was working at a bookstore helping to tidy up and clean up the store, and Axis and Allies was the game I got once I'd saved up enough money. It was my first big purchase I'd ever made for myself. I was captivated by all the plastic pieces and the possibilities of the game. So while some other games I played at people's houses or had been brought for me as birthday or Christmas presents, this was the very first game I got for me with money I'd earned. So it's forever going to occupy a special place in my heart. I don't actually have a copy of that game anymore. It got stolen from a room at high school when I left it there at lunch. But I did pick up the anniversary edition, which is a much better version of the game, to replace it about 15 years ago. 1980s top game is the oldest game I reviewed on the channel, and that's Civilization. Civilization is another one of those games that hasn't aged particularly well. Its playtime is insanely long by modern standards, but the power of nostalgia strikes again. We spent an awful lot of time playing this game, sometimes even playing it over two days. And it's mostly on here because of those fond memories of spending time with people I liked over an extended period of time while the game was just there while we were socializing. Civilization was recently reprinted, but I don't think it's one of those games that's going to work well in a modern market. It's just too long for what it is these days for the average gamer to go, yeah, I can commit 12 hours to playing a game. That sounds like fun. But at its core, there's a lot of the early ideas of what a Euro game could be in Civilization. It's got diceless combat. It's got set collection and trading. It's got technology advances and engine building. It's actually quite an influential game in its own right. And while I still have an old edition of that game, I can't see myself playing it anytime soon. 1979's number one rated game is June at 243. I played June sometime in the 80s, and it was completely and utterly overwhelming for us. It was at a friend's house, and it was in his dad's games collection, and we popped it out, and we had a play, and we were like, nah, no idea how this game works. But I really remember wanting to understand how it works, and it's one of those games that sat with me going, I really want to give that game another go in, in the future. It looked like it was really cool. We just, you know, we were young, and we just couldn't figure it out. 
Little did I know that it was going to become an out-of-print collector's item and that I wouldn't get an opportunity to play it again for a very, very long time. In fact, most of the plays I've had of this game are of the remake of it, Rex, which mechanically is very similar, but unfortunately is saddled with a theme that just isn't as engaging or compelling as the June theme. Which is a pity, because Rex is actually quite a good-looking game and a lot of fun. It's just, it's not June. It never will be June. Another game probably never to see the light of day as a reprint. It's been 40 years since it came out, so if you really want a copy, you might as well just go to Board Game Geek and make your own. There are files there that can help you do that. 978 was also not a great year for games. The highest rated game on here is Hunter, which is the game I'm going to pick at 1036. Hunter's another one of those games we ended up playing a lot at university, mostly while drinking. Yeah, there's a lot of university drinking stories involved in this later period because these are the games that we had and this is what we were doing and drinking is what we did. Hunter has several problems. It takes a lot longer to play than it should for what it is. Especially when you're doing the coups, those can drag on quite a long time. And also, fundamentally, it's pretty racist. Now this is another game I'd like to see sort of redone with the core ideas and a lot of streamlining. I think the Hunter idea of the Banana Republic itself is pretty dated, but the idea of a corrupt government where players are different office members competing for positions and stockpiling money definitely has potential. Just there's got to be a better way to interpret it. And finally, the year of my birth, 1977. The year Star Wars came out. This is why I don't refer to myself as Generation X or a Millennial. I am Generation X-Wing. And the best game of this year is going to be no surprises to anyone, especially if they know Tom Vassell. And that game is Cosmic Encounter. 42 years later, Cosmic Encounter is still going strong, and that is an achievement and a half. I mean, I'm not going that strong. Its core idea of a simple gameplay element modified by a whole bunch of variable powers has had a profound influence on all of gaming. And unlike a lot of designs from this period, it still holds up pretty well today. And part of that is probably nostalgia, but I still think this is a solid enough game that it'll be played for another 20, 30, 40 years. So happy birthday to me, 42 years old today, here's to 42 more. I hope you enjoyed this nostalgia driven trip down board gaming memory lane. And if you want to do the same thing yourself, just go to Board Game Geek, click on Advanced Search, and search by year published range, and just fill in the year. And feel free to post your list below in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, like it, subscribe to the channel, and check out our Patreon.